Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm your host today, Stephen, and I'm speaking with Professor Janelle Goodwill, the Neubauer Family Assistant Professor at the Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy, and Practice. Professor Goodwill received a master's in social work and in psychology from the University of Michigan, where she also completed her PhD in social work and psychology. She's currently the principal investigator for a new suicide prevention intervention designed to support the specific mental health needs of Black students in Chicago. She's here to talk to us about her career path and how she became a University of Chicago professor. Professor Goodwill, welcome to the course. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me today. So we're going to get into your work and we're going to get into your bio a little bit before that. But first off, what do you do now and how would you explain your research interests to a layperson? Great question. So I am currently an assistant professor at the University of Chicago in the Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice. My work really focuses on suicide prevention and mental health promotion. And I would explain this to a layperson as really my work, my research is really focused on really trying to conduct studies that identify reasons why people think about ending their life. But also the goal of my research is to offer some solutions for strategies that people can implement that will make their mental health and their psychological well-being better. So it's, it's two ends of a spectrum. I certainly want to do research that prevents suicide, but at the same time, my, the goal of my work is still trying to encourage people to practice habits and to pursue some, some strategies that will help them ultimately have the best mental health that they possibly can. Could you just sort of briefly give us an overview of your career path, beginning in college through where you are now? What different you know, positions have you held and what different institutions have you attended? So I uh, completed my undergraduate studies at Michigan State University in East Lansing, Michigan. I got involved in research in my very first semester of college and served as a volunteer research assistant for a professor in a department of psychology. And that was really my first introduction to research. And I was really excited by it. I mean, the topic was focused on doing some brain monitoring, sort of imaging and experiments. And while that's not the work that I do now, it was just an opportunity to have some exposure to learn more about what research is, to learn more about what professors do. Um, and for me, that was really impactful. And so really throughout my time in college, I was involved as a research assistant with different projects. So once I participated in that project, I then moved forward in participating in some, some research studies and labs that were more so focused on issues related to social psychology, intergroup relations, addressing issues around race and racism. And so I did that throughout undergrad. And then I decided to pursue my master's in social work degree, then transitioned after graduating from Michigan State. I went just about an hour away to the University of Michigan, which is in Ann Arbor. Anybody who was from Michigan knows that those are in-state rivals, but I <laughs> thought they were just the two best public schools in my state. So I was happy to attend both. And it was while I was at the University of Michigan with my master's in social work degree, where I really had the opportunity to hone in and do research that felt very aligned with what I'm doing now, felt very much aligned with um, my values, with the most pressing topics that I was seeing happening in my life and in my friends' lives. And so it was there um, when I was a master's student in social work that I began to participate in research that focused on young Black men's mental health. I was involved um, in a project that's led by Dr. Daphne Watkins, who is still a professor at the University of Michigan. And she became really just a very close mentor of mine. And it was through her mentorship that I uh, gained really the research skills that I needed to prepare me for a PhD program. And so once I finished my master's degree at Michigan, I decided to stay and do a PhD in the joint social work and psychology program. And so Stephen, this is one of the unique programs in the country because it really allows students to pursue two degrees or two fields of study simultaneously. And so a lot of times people who might be interested in social work and psychology will oftentimes have to choose between one or the other. Well, University of Michigan offers students the opportunity to choose social work as a PhD uh, area of study along with another social science. And so I selected psychology because that's what I studied in undergrad and it aligns very much with my interests. So 
Long story short, while I was at the University of Michigan doing my master's and now my PhD, that's when I really, really dove in to getting much more experience doing intervention research. And so by that, I mean that aside from doing lab-based experiments, our research team actually went out and we interacted with people outside of the university space. And that was very meaningful for me. While I love the university campus and the intellectual conversations that happen there, I think that there's something especially meaningful about being intentional about interacting with people who have no affiliation with the university, who maybe you wouldn't talk to every day. I feel like researchers have so much to learn from people outside of our traditional academic spaces. And so while I was at the University of Michigan doing my PhD, I got very involved in intervention research. And I also began to do some research with my advisor in psychology that focused more around topics related to positive psychology. So by that, I mean, you know, folks like myself, we do research on suicide prevention, but then there's an entire group of you know, fields of study within psychology that focuses on positive psychological aspects like hope and optimism and altruism and things like that and spirituality. And so I began to really be able to combine the intervention research I was doing with my social work advisor, Dr. Watkins, with the new information I was learning from my psychology advisor. Her name is Dr. Jackie Matisse. And together, I just had truly a transformative and, and just just beautiful experience in my PhD program. I know that that might be unusual for some people to <laughs> say, <laughs> but I can tell you, Stephen, there is nothing else that I would have rather been doing than being a PhD student at the University of Michigan, pursuing my PhD in social work and psychology. I mean, I just received outstanding training, but also really meaningful mentorship from two professors who were both Black women who really poured into me in ways that are really, really meaningful to me as a young Black woman and trying to see myself and trying to figure out who I was and trying to really think about if this was a degree and a career path that I could pursue uh, moving forward. So um, I will wrap this up quickly because I feel like I've been talking a long time. But once I finished the PhD at the University of Michigan, I then transitioned to where I am now, which is the University of Chicago, where I work as an assistant professor in the School of Social Work. Um, And so I'm really excited about the work that I'm doing here in Chicago and really curious to see what sorts of new collaborations and opportunities come forth. So I did want to go back and just ask about when you were, you know, much younger, like grade school, middle school, what did you see yourself doing at that time? And looking back, were were there any hints at that point of, of what you would end up doing? Yeah, I love that question. Thanks for asking that. As a child, particularly, I think, by middle school, I would tell people that I wanted to be a psychologist or I wanted to play the flute professionally. I think I was getting pretty good personally at the flute, but that did not uh, (laughs) go as planned. So I left that one to be, and I actually, I haven't played the flute in many years. So I think maybe I should pick that back up as a hobby. But yeah, by middle school, I was telling people that I wanted to be a psychologist. And by that, I meant that I, I thought that I would be doing more, maybe direct practice therapy and work. And that's actually what pursued in my master's level training in social work. My plan was to become a clinician. And to do direct practice work with individuals and families. But I have since pursued research full time. And so, you know, even though I initially thought I would be a psychologist, I feel like I'm pretty close to doing what I thought I was going to do. And my mom would always say that, you know, she was surprised that even as early as middle school that my friends would call our house phone because this is before, you know, kids had cell phones just, you know, regularly. But people would call our house phone, my friends from school, and they'd ask me to just listen to what they were experiencing and to just hear them out and talk with them about what was happening in their lives. I mean, I mean, I was, what, 12, so I didn't have any, you know, lived experience or tons of advice to give. <laughs> but but listening is something that I feel like I've, I've learned to be good at over time. And I think that listening is something that's really essential when you're a researcher, particularly someone who does interviews or qualitative research, listening to people's stories and then analyzing those stories and preparing that for either a book or a research article is so key. So so yeah, so I thought I'd be a psychologist and I feel like I'm pretty close to that at this point. So (laughs) I do. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really interesting through line. That's cool. You already spoke about a couple of people and I was just curious, you know, if you want to go more in depth on them or if there was anyone else who comes to mind, but were there any particular people who, you know, whose support was really important to you as you were pursuing your PhD and, and, you know, getting to the place you are now, who are some of the people who had a huge role in that? Well, yes. I mean, I could, you know, certainly point to my advisors in the PhD program, Dr. Daphne Watkins and Dr. Jackie Matisse. Uh, Their mentorship was 
life-changing and transformative. And I, I know that there are many people who unfortunately don't have those experiences. And I'm always grieved to hear that because I feel like I'm a product of what can happen when you really do have mentors who are invested in you as an academic, as a student, as a future colleague, but also just as a person. And so really, I, I feel like I, I know that I am where I am now because of the mentorship, the hands-on mentorship and training I received from them. Um, their support, uh, their confidence in me allowed me to feel more confident because unfortunately, you know, graduate school, the PhD program is not designed to make you feel good about yourself. <laughs> you know, I think, especially as a mental health researcher, I think about all of the unique stressors that emerge in graduate school, the insecurities that can come up, the doubts and the criticisms. I mean, really, people who sign up to be academics are signing up to learn how to become professionals who deal with rejection. We deal with rejection when we're submitting grants, when we're submitting papers, proposals, anything. I mean, rejection is just so much a part of our job and that can be very taxing psychologically. And, you know, when I look back at my time in graduate school, I recognize that having mentors who taught me how to respond to rejection, who taught me how to move through it instead of letting it paralyze me was really, really transformative. But even before then, I think that seeing Seeing my professors in undergrad, particularly Black professors that I had in undergrad, like Dr. LaShawn Harris, Dr. Lou June, Dr. Isa Settles, they were all at Michigan State at that time. So Isa Settles is now at the University of Michigan. You know, seeing them in the classroom was just life-changing for me. I mean, I just lit up when I was in their classes and I feel that it was so important for me to see someone who looked like me leading the classroom and asking really interesting questions in research and providing instruction and guidance for students. I mean, seeing them really piqued my curiosity, my interest in pursuing the role of the professor and researcher full-time. So I would say it's really been those folks who have been really helpful in terms of helping me think about what this career could look like and how I could possibly contribute, along with the wonderful support of my parents, my cousins, my aunts, my dear friends. You know, graduate school is a really challenging time, I think, for anyone. While my experience was beautiful, it definitely had its hardships. But having my friends who I met in the program there really, really, I think, was a, a great anchor and helped carry me through a lot of difficulties. But then also maintaining relationships outside of outside of the academic work, like with your family and friends from other seasons and stages in your life is also important too. So I cannot point to just one person. There is just such a, a wonderful group of people who've poured into me and helped support me. And I really needed all of them. Um, but those are just some of the folks that I would highlight at this point. You may have sort of sort of answered this just a minute ago, but you, know, you mentioned that you had long held this interest in becoming a psychologist. Was there a moment at which you decided to go the academia route or, you know, what, what do you think pushed you in that direction? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I remember being in my master's program. That was two years of master's and social work program. And I had gotten involved in research in my first year of the master's program. And because my experience in research was going so well, I decided that in the last year of my master's program, I was, gonna, I was going to apply to the PhD program. And so I would say really my decision to pursue research over practicing social work directly in a clinical setting, I think it really happened for me in between my first and second year of the MSW program. I just began to recognize that my brain was full of questions and that being a professor meant that I could literally be paid to come up with questions and then use research to answer those questions. Anything that I'm interested in, I could, I could pursue any topic that I found to be motivating and helpful to others and deeply interesting. And that just seemed like the best job ever. A uh, career committed to learning, a career committed to knowledge acquisition and to really centering and prioritizing people's stories in research just seemed like such a treat to me. So I would say it's between that first and second year where I began to think that perhaps research full time really would be a better route for me. So yeah, let's talk about your field and your research. What is exciting you or inspiring you in your field right now? And you know, what are you uh, looking into that, you know, those questions that you just mentioned, <laughs> what are some of your, your current questions? Well, what's exciting me at the moment is some new research that I'm doing around meaning in life and life purpose. 
and how that's connected to concepts like hope and hopelessness and suicidal risk. And so I just am working on a study right now that's ex it's exploring the experiences of Black adults during COVID-19 and really trying to assess whether people who believe that their life has meaning and purpose, if they are ultimately faring better and if they are at a uh, lower risk for suicide or for suicidal thoughts during the pandemic. And so I, I think that sometimes it can be easy in academic settings to just kind of go through the motions or to just kind of get lost in the monotony. But pursuing and asking questions about, you know, these are these fundamental key questions about meaning in life and life purpose, particularly among the group like Black Americans who have been denigrated and just really told that their, their lives have less meaning and value throughout history, to me has just been particularly inspiring and, and exciting for me in this stage of my work. So, I um, mean, I think it's really timely. You know, there are many people who are struggling with their mental health right now. I mean, we are in 2022 and still feeling the impacts and still living in the pandemic. You know, it's not over. And so I would say these questions around meaning and life and life purpose are really fueling so much inspiration and creativity for me right now that I'm really excited about. How do you get that information? Like, how, how do you get that sort of very deep personal thing? How do you get that out of people? Is, is it as simple as asking them, do you think that your life has a purpose? Like, <laughs> how does this research look? Yeah, yeah. So to, to this point, up to this point, in terms of the meaning of life and life purpose work, I've been collecting that information via surveys. And so there are some existing scales that psychologists have created. The scale that I'm using is by uh, Steger and colleagues published in 2006, and it's the Meaning in Life questionnaire. And so essentially, I create an online survey. The survey is administered to, say, maybe a thousand people or so, all adults, and folks respond to the survey items, you know, on their phone or on their laptop. So the questionnaire includes 10 questions that ask about, you know, how they are perceiving meaning in life and, and the purpose of their life. And so using surveys is one option. I think that a, a much deeper way and a way that you certainly get, I think, uh, more depth in your responses is to do what you're mentioning, interviews or even focus groups. I have not begun to do the interviews and focus groups around meaning in life yet, though that is a project I am taking up this fall. So the start of the new school year, I'll be doing some more qualitative research around, around those very topics. But you're completely right. It is really difficult for people to talk about things that are deeply personal and oftentimes painful. And I think that's where researchers have a responsibility to really ensure that they're recruiting from places that are appropriate and sensitive. And so I may reach out and design a study where I'm intentionally reaching people who maybe they're already in therapy. So if I if I were to ask a question that was really sensitive, you know, they're already connected with a list of with, with their own mental health professional where they can continue to process these, some of the, some of these difficult topics. All the research that I've done that's been less sensitive, we've been able to recruit more generally from online sources. But but I do think that around these personal topics, I think typically, especially around suicide prevention, you know, res researchers have a responsibility to ensure that they're really intentional and strategic um, in terms of where they're recruiting to ensure that they're not, you know, putting people in a really uncomfortable and awkward situation and not dealing and not putting people in a position where they feel pressure to participate in the study as well. So, I mean, you you mentioned a little bit of, of what you're going to be up to and, and what you hope to get up to there. But, uh, you know, you're a pretty early career academic. I'm curious, big picture wise, what are some things that you're hoping to do that you're looking forward to, maybe not just in the next you know semester, but further along in your career? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think one of the key things that I know that I will be doing, and that's something that's long term, is really training students. So professors, they teach classes, right? Like that's obvious. People know they teach classes, but um, sometimes people may not recognize that professors also spend a lot of time, especially in the social sciences. Uh, professors oftentimes form research labs where they begin a lot of times long term relationships with students, you know. So there will be students who are pursuing their PhDs who I work with for five, six, seven years. You know, that is something that I'm excited about because those are real working relationships that will be formed that where I'll have the opportunity to train and mentor, hopefully in the same ways that I was trained and mentored, uh, you know, with, of course, my own spin on it. But I'm really looking forward to long term having the opportunity to invest in students at the PhD level, but I also am looking forward to being able to invest in undergraduate students and master's students and really help create a pipeline of undergraduate and master's students who are from underrepresented backgrounds to actually pursue the PhD. 
I'm not saying it's for everyone, but it is my goal to ensure that young people who are interested in pursuing the PhD have the skills and resources necessary to be strong applicants for the PhD programs they want to be admitted to. I'm looking forward to being able to really help establish a pipeline that would be training undergraduate and master's students to pursue these PhD programs um, when they're ready. I think also in terms of my research, I have begun some intervention work that will be starting here in Chicago very soon. But ideally, I mean, I'm, I really would love for my work to be um, to have a broader reach because, you know, I think as I'm sure many people have talked to me about before, a lot of times the work that professors do does not reach really outside of the university. I mean, we write academic papers, but those are not available for the general public. And so really it's a long-term goal of mine to really write publicly in ways that reach people beyond the universities, so whether that's op-eds or blog posts or even a book uh, for a trade press. Like those are things that I'm really excited by, but that I know are likely more further down the road, more long-term goals that I'll, I'll be working towards over the coming years. Yeah, it's it's cool that you're thinking about it in those terms, though, of like normal people reading and learning from your research. <laughs> exactly, like that. exactly. Yeah, because, I mean, as it stands, my family, you know, they don't have access to the academic papers that I write, you know, unless I send them to them. But it's not like someone, I think the problem is that someone who may be genuinely interested in these topics, you know, they wouldn't be able to access the academic papers because they're behind a paywall and it's super expensive. And so I think it really puts researchers in a position to be creative and to think really intentionally about how to ensure that our work is meaningful and that it reaches the people that it needs to. So you talked about this this pipeline and, you know, your interest in working with undergraduates. What advice would you have for someone in that position, you know, undergraduate or even younger who, you know, would be interested in following in your footsteps? Oh, excellent question. I would encourage them to get involved working with a professor right away, whether you're a high school student and you live near a university or an undergraduate student. You don't have to have previous experience to work as a research assistant. I think that a lot of times faculty members are always looking for students that they could bring onto their team. And again, like I mentioned, my first research experiences were not directly related to the topics that I study now, but at that time it was more so about getting exposure and learning and building relationships with professors. And so I would encourage anyone who is an undergraduate student or high school student that if you're thinking about research, then I would encourage you to reach out directly to professors and ask them if they they have a need or if they have any openings to research assistant positions. One of the structural issues, Stephen, is that a lot of times universities may not have a central listing of all the professors who are looking for research assistants across different departments. Because sometimes maybe a student is studying sociology, they may not even know about a professor who's in psychology. Okay. And so a lot of times, you know, these postings are not always clear and then, and then made, students may not always know about it. So I would encourage you, as, as, encourage any, any prospective student, anyone who's undergrad or high school to send emails directly, send cold emails, even if you have to send a follow-up email because the person doesn't respond right away. You know, faculty, unfortunately, are pretty busy or may, maybe your email got lost, but I would encourage you to reach out and send a cold email and ask if that person is looking for research assistance, because that could be an opportunity for you to gain some hands-on experience that could then just help prepare and propel you into your next research opportunity that may be an even better fit for you down the road. I'm shocked to hear the implication that professors don't always respond to emails promptly. <laughs> 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 oh, wild yeah. wild stuff but um, no that's uh based on my proximity to academia that's that's a recurring theme that i've heard before but absolutely worth reaching out i think that's great advice so you know what are the not so fun aspects of your job <laughs> what is what what about this do you not love so much i think that some of the not so fun aspects are for me just you know learning how to best serve students during the pandemic has definitely been a challenge you know I started my position in the summer of 2020 so I mean I finished my dissertation at the beginning of the pandemic and started here at University of Chicago at the beginning of the pandemic and it is a challenge I think to really 
try to understand how to best support students while also attending to my own mental health needs. Um, we know that life is happening for many people, many, many people that we know, maybe even some of our listeners who will hear this podcast later, you know, may have lost a loved one, maybe experiencing just unexpected and overwhelming grief due to the loss of a loved one during the pandemic or for different reasons. And so I think some of the not so fun aspects of the job have been really trying to trying to figure out how to best support students, how to best structure my class, how to navigate teaching on person and online, how to do that at the same time, um, while also trying to prioritize and and be careful about my own mental health concerns and needs. And so that has that has not been fun. That's been a great challenge that I think faculty across the country are, are navigating and managing because the pressures of being a new professor, of being a faculty member, of being a young Black woman have not been easy. And so, you know, therapy has been a great support and a great help to me. I'm thankful that I have the resources to go to therapy, though I recognize that, you know, everyone may not have insurance and that might be another barrier. But I will say that for folks who are students, whether you use Chicago or other schools, you know, there are college campus counseling centers where you can get some short-term care for addressing any mental health concern. And so I would say the not-so-fun parts have really been just trying to address the mental health concerns and the really practical needs of students, of faculty, of myself uh, during the pandemic. Our last question is maybe a big one, but I, I think I've already heard you answer it in a couple of ways. What is the most gratifying thing that you do in your field? Hmm. Oh, that's such a tough question because I feel <laughs> there are many things. What's the most gratifying? Huh? I would, I would say... So far, okay, let me preface it by saying so far, because like you mentioned, I'm still pretty early. I just finished my second year. I think the most gratifying thing so far is when I meet parents whose children have died by suicide and they tell me that what I've written or the study that I've done is, is helpful to them. Or I talk with parents who are currently trying to navigate some of the complexities of what it means for their children to have some serious mental health concerns for their kids who may be currently at risk for suicide. And they tell me that the paper that I wrote or the project or the presentation that I did was really helpful. Um, and in the time that I've been here at East Chicago, I've been able to get connected with some families who are survivors of suicide. And that's been very, very meaningful and gratifying knowing that, you know, I'm not just writing for nothing, that this is really a way to reach people and to really have an impact that could change lives forever. And so I would say to date, that's been what's, what's been most gratifying is having the chance to connect with families and parents who tell me that this work is meaningful and important and that they value what I do. Professor Goodwill, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Stephen. So great talking with you. Thank you, Professor Janelle Goodwill, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more. See you around.